Is it going? Two. Yeah. One. Jack Sorensen, what's up, buddy? How are you? Man, it's good to be on here finally. I was, How are you doing? I've been waiting for my invite in the mail. Oh, no, really? Yeah. I might have just lost you. No, it's okay. It's all good. Oh, can you hear me still? <laughs> yeah, I got you. Um, what's up? How's your cold plunge this morning? It's beautiful. It's the best part of my day, man. It's the best part, the of, best part of your day. Uh, yeah, no, it's the best part of my day. It's the hardest part of my day, and I just put it right in the morning, and then everything is just way easier from then on. You know? How cold's how cold's the water? It's however cold it is outside. So oh. certain days it's really cold. Other days it's not bad at all. So I just kind of leave it there, and then it, if it freezes at night, it freezes, and you're out with like a hammer, and you got to break it all up, and then you get in. But like this morning, it really wasn't too bad. Um, it was probably like, I don't know. 40 degrees, 40 something degrees. So how long really are you going in for? Normal. Um, I don't really have a time. Uh, it, it's more just, I, I do breathing. So I, God, I forget the name of this, but, um, I was listening to this podcast and it was this woman who was kind of like starting to read life and she had started going, going to therapist and she started going to, like meditation experts. And, um, she found something that was really like worked really well for her was four seconds in seven second, hold eight seconds out. And she would do that for cycles of 10 breath, um, or cycles of 10. And so I do one cycle of 10 and sometimes it, it really all just depends on how, how fast I count. If I'm like really cold, my counting might get a little faster. If I'm feeling good, my counting might be a little slower. Um, so it's probably hits around like three to four minutes every time I do it. So it's not. It's so not you're, long. you're in, you're in for ten, and then you're out for seven. No, so it's in for four. So it's like a really hard four. It's like, like you're breathing really hard in, and then you hold for seven, and then you're out for like a slow eight. Oh wow! So and then you just like my big thing with that is like, it's three minutes, three to four minutes, super short. But like it's, I try to make it the most intentional three to four minutes of my day. So like I have an intention in mind, like the whole time. So for instance, today's was efficiency, right? So like yesterday I was super inefficient. And like at the end of my days, I always sit down and I think about like, what wasn't great about today, right? Like what can I capitalize on tomorrow? And yesterday I had a ton of wasted time um, in between meetings, in between, uh, I'm, I'm doing like a real estate course right now. So like halfway through a, a module, I would find myself scrolling on my phone, right? And then I'd have to go back and rewatch the videos that I was going through. And it was like, that's so inefficient, you know? And so like today my intention was efficiency and it's setting stopwatches on. Um, when I go back to doing my real estate stuff later, it's like set an hour time or whatever, like an alarm on my phone and then set my phone in a different room. And when I hear that alarm go off, okay, I can go grab my phone. I take 10, 15 minute break and then go back. But for that hour, I'm going to be as efficient as possible. It's like, that's my intention that I set for those three or four minutes. So when you look back on your day, like at night, are you writing this down in like a notebook? Like tomorrow I'm going to be more efficient? No, I I should though. I should. I don't do that. It's more just like reverse engineering my day. Um, And there's like some things that definitely stick out. Like I think we can all sit down after every day and be like wow okay that sucked today or like that was awesome today but it's really just trying to like look in between the big events and be like okay you know the big events are the staples of the day but there's a lot more time in between the big events that make up the day and like in between those what was I doing good versus what was I doing was wasn't I doing good right like the staple of my day yesterday wasn't sitting down for three hours and like watching modules. Like that wasn't that exciting to me. Um, it was a necessary means, but like the staple of my day yesterday within real estate was getting my level one certification in financial modeling on Excel. Right. But the three hours that led to that were very inefficient. So it's like focusing on those things. It's like, how could I, how could I have been more efficient and gotten my certification faster or, or, or better, you know? It's like looking in between the weeds. Like that's what I try to do at the end of the day. Have you always been like introspective like this? Um, Not from this perspective. I think like I was always, I would always 
have like look at things way too big picture and be like like look at the end goal um yeah let me let me try to think about how much time this is so I, I i would sit down every day and be like okay this is my end goal right um how can i achieve that today and it was like you can't you can't you sit down that. in the morning and do that yeah like i would okay. sit down in the morning like this is what i used to do i'd sit down in the morning and i'd be journaling um and i'd be writing down like my affirmations and like my random business ideas and all that stuff you know um and then i'd be like how can i achieve like my goal would be let's take it back to like the whole nfl thing right it's like how could i how can i how can i achieve that goal today um but it it was a very good thing and i think it created like a very good um like it, it created momentum towards it but i don't think it was good in the sense of like if you only have your eyes set on the light at the end of the tunnel, you're forgetting like the most necessary and important steps that are right in front of you. Right. And like that light at the end of the tunnel can sometimes move away, can sometimes get closer. And if that's all you're focused on, some days are going to be a lot harder to take steps forward than other days. But if all you're focused on is like, I just have to do, I just have to take that step. Like that's all I got to do today. Like the, just that one step, like your days become so much more, exciting because you're achieving so much more instead of being like, Oh my gosh, I still have 532 more steps to reach the end of the tunnel. You know, it's just like, no, just, just one step. And that's where my focus is now. It's not like, I know what my goals are, but it's not, how can I take 500 steps in a day? It's how can I take one? How can I take one and a half? You know, like it's so Mm -hmm. much more, um, like present, like Ryan McWood, you had him on, on your podcast. I think it was either the last one or the, or the first one he lived with. He, I got the chance to kind of go back and room with him again. And I was going through, we can get later into this podcast. Like it's been like a really, really difficult couple of months for me mentally. And just having him here as a different perspective and as somebody that's just so strong willed. Um, and I, I think like just so mature beyond even his years was great for me. And he always reminded me of, uh, be where your feet are. And he said that all the time. And to me, that was like, that's such a good reminder of like, why are you living 500 steps in the future? Live for the step that you're taking right now, you know, and like focus on that one and then focus on the next one and then focus on the next one. And eventually you'll take 500 steps and you'll be at your goal. But if that's all you're focusing on, it just looks so unattainable. I don't know if that answered your question, but maybe it did. No, it did. That was awesome. I, uh, I, I resonate with that a lot because I think I have a problem of like looking really, really far in the future and like you have to, you know, dial it back to a certain point of like understanding that the only way you get to an end goal, like you can't do it. I like to use the analogy of like a marathon. Like if you're going to run 26.2 miles, you, you can't run the whole race at once. You have to run the mile you're in every day, every yeah. step you're in. And I think there's a, there's a famous um, kind of similar, a little bit more intense of an example to what you're talking about. But there's this famous guy who's a, um, his name's James Stockdale. And he was in a prisoner of war camp in Vietnam. And he was a pilot that got shot down and he was captured. And he's got this like famous thing, like you can never lose sight of getting out of prison he's a prisoner but you can't forget your current reality and he said like the people that would lose their minds were the people that were expecting to get out at a certain time like he was saying that you are going to get out eventually but you can't lose sight of the the current reality of the situation you're in i think that's an analogy for like any type of goal you're trying to trying to do like if you're trying to lose 10 pounds you're not going to lose 10 pounds in an hour so i think that is what a lot of people miss and i i myself included like you know doing the podcast like i feel like you know i want like a million listeners but i'm never going to get to a million and now it's crazy because i'm looking back i'm like i value like one listener yeah that's true um Yeah. I mean, I think, I think it's just perspective, you know, like when, when it's so odd saying like when I was younger, like a year ago, right. Um, if you were to ask me as a 25 year old, 
would I be back living with my parents? I'd be like, no, dude, I'm going to be with an NFL team. I'm going to be doing this and in the off season training here. Like I had my whole life planned out and I lost focus of what I needed to do right now to allow myself to even have those things. And I was focusing too far into the future and understanding my current reality as low priority undrafted guy going into a team with some of the best receivers in the country, probably the best receiving core in the country. And I lost, I lost sensibility and I was focusing way too far into like things that I, I shouldn't have been focusing on, you know, like where are Paige and I going to live? Like, where should we rent? Where should we like all these things? I'm like, okay, I haven't even made the team, like focus on making the team and then figure those things out, you know? Um, and I think it's so easy. Like, it's so easy to do that when all you see on Instagram, social media, all these other platforms is the end result of everybody. You never see the years and years and years and years and years of hard work failure that it takes to get there. And to me, it was like, I lost focus for a second, for a second on that goal of being in the NFL, because I, for some reason it felt like maybe I was there. And I wasn't. And now I'm kind of enduring the consequences of, of that lost focus. How do you combat the feelings of, you know, putting in all the work to do something, years and years of football, to not making the team? How do you deal with that? And then how do you process it moving it forward? Yeah, I think that goes that goes a lot into these past like what I've been learning about myself these past couple months. Um and Paige, she she's my girlfriend. Um she has been like the cornerstone of my growth these past couple months. Um just like helping me realize some toxic traits that I had about myself that I think in sports alone are viewed as very, very um, like awesome traits to have, but when they're not being applied to sports can be, can become extremely toxic. Um, like what specifically? So in specifics, like I don't think that I deserve the basic things that other people deserve in life. As far as like being able to sleep in, right? Like I feel extreme guilt if I sleep in. Um, being able to take a cheat day, I feel extreme guilt. Um, it's, it's those basic things like that you are allowed to do just because you're alive and just because you are who you are. I'm just because I'm Jack Sorensen, I'm allowed to have a carrot cake if I want to have it. I'm allowed Mm -hmm. to sleep in past eight if I want to. And it's those type of things that as an athlete and as a competitor that you like build these stories in your mind that if you don't get up at six, if you don't have the healthiest diet, if you don't um, compete with yourself every single day that someone else out there is and you're going to lose. Right. And it was like, once I didn't have a sport to apply that to, it was just like a very unhealthy, toxic way of living. You know, like when you don't have a place to put all that stuff and the only place you have to put it, is like back into yourself. Like it, it, you just create like a toxic cycle. And that was like what I was going through. Um, and also like I was going through a crazy humility check at the time, you know, um, I go from doing really well at Miami, getting signed on with the Bengals, which is like 45 minutes away. So like I still a lot of the fan base and a lot of the people that had surrounded me at Miami were all supporting me and showing up to, to the off season training stuff, like in the, in all the preseason things. And it was like, it, it was just so, so toxic for me to be in that environment. And then to come back to this, it's like, you have to reset and you have to like, remember that, like, you know, you're not all that, like, that's not who you are. Like, that's not your identity. Like you are Jack, just as your, as your core, you're Jack. And just being Jack, like you, doesn't mean like it let me let me try to let me try to rephrase what i'm saying because i feel like i'm getting lost real quick no you're good i guess like my biggest issue like 
the thing that Paige and I worked through a lot was that I didn't feel like I was supposed to be su- allowed, I should say, to have the basic things that other people were allowed to experience in life. Cheat meals, getting up late, watching things like watching movies at night um, because I hadn't achieved anything. And because I haven't achieved anything, I didn't deserve those things. Um, but then when we got down to it, I realized that I could never achieve something that would give me this, that I would be able to give myself the allowance to ever experience those things. Because when we go back to like, I signed a contract in the NFL, right? Like I got to be an NFL player, but I never celebrated it. And when my parents tried to celebrate it, I got really angry at them for trying to celebrate this because I feel like I hadn't deserved it. Right. So like, even though I had achieved what my childhood goal was, I felt like I didn't deserve the praise or the, or the things that came along with it. And I guess that was like the toxic cycle I was going through. And then once I didn't have anything, it just compounded and it became so much worse because I was like reaching for anything and everything that could give me an affirmation that would allow me to feel like I had accomplished anything because I felt like I hadn't accomplished anything. It sounds like you were suffering a lot from imposter syndrome, which like a lot of athletes feel, a lot of musicians, comedians feel that they don't deserve things in life because they're, they don't feel like they deserve like the accolades or the achievements they've gotten because they don't feel like they're that person really. And like, I know I've, I've dealt with this personally of just like you earn, like you get, you achieve something and then you're kind of just like, I don't deserve this. Like, this isn't me. And I'm just curious now how you, you know, are channeling that. Cause I think some of what you were saying of like, you know, I don't, I don't, I feel guilty if I don't sleep in, but it's also kind of holding yourself accountable. So like, I think some of that lends to, the success you've had as an athlete, how do you channel it more positively to, you know, achieving goals without it becoming toxic? Because there's, there's a line of, you know, you're not holding yourself accountable enough and then you're almost taking too much responsibility for your own fault. So like, how are you kind of towing that line? Yeah. I think a lot of that just comes down to having like a great accountability partner and like Paige is my accountability partner. And She's really good at identifying when I start spiraling and that's kind of what we call it is like spiraling down that, um, you could just, I I don't know what, what you want to call it, but just down that path of like almost mental Mm self-harm of like what kind of everything that I just said. And I think when she starts noticing that she lets me know. And sometimes I don't even like, I don't agree with her. I'm like, no, I'm just like working through something. And like, I've just, I just have my head down and I'm working hard. And she's like, but why do you have your head down? You know? And like, once you start asking like the why questions a lot, you realize that like, at least I realize that a lot of the reasons that I'm doing something aren't necessarily for like goal achieving reasons. Like it's not to reach this end goal that I've always had. It's more because like, I I don't feel like I can take a break. Like I don't feel like I'm allowed to take a break. You know, and I don't feel like I've earned the the right to sit back and relax for a second. So like the second that I feel like I could, I have to dive into something else and I have to like find an opportunity to suffer, if that makes sense. Do you think like I, that's what led to like a lot of your success though? I think it is like, I think, it, but I th- also think in athletics, like athletics, certain attributes of athletics translate great to the real world. Right. And like to the corporate world, I really do think it does. But I think when you get to like the extremes and I I, I do think that like my mindset is pretty extreme in that sense. I think it, it doesn't translate as well. I think it translates great to football, but I don't think it translate translates great to, to other, other areas of my life. Um, Especially if I am hopefully wanting to manage a team or, or a company or something like that one day, if I have the expectation and if I'm the leader and I'm doing things the one way, I'm going to burn everybody out, you know? And like, for some people that's like, Oh, like, you know, I'm going to outwork everybody. But like, 
that's not always a good thing, you know, like that's, that's not. Um, and I think that's what I'm starting to learn is like, it's okay to outwork people, but at the cost of what, you know, is it at the cost of my relationships? Is it at the cost of my personal mental health? Um, at the cost of what? And that's what I'm starting to dissect right now. Yeah. There's this concept I, I have been really thinking about recently. Um, have you heard of Chris Williamson? No, I haven't. He's got an excellent podcast called Modern Wisdom. And I've been, he's, he's like a psychology philosophy guy, but um, he talks about this, like, choose what you're going to suck at. So it's like when you're, you know, deciding to do certain things, like choose what you're going to be shitty at, choose what you're going to suck at. So it's like, if you want to be, you know, great football player, certain aspects of your life are going to suffer. Your relationships are going to break down with friends and family. You're not going to have enough time, you know, to do certain things. If you want to get into really good shape, your social life is going to take a hit. If you're going to be, you know, but if you want to make more friends, your physique and athletic ability is going to take a hit. So I think that's one thing that people have to make those big decisions on. If they want to start doing something, something else is going to suffer. And it's just that, you know, pendulum of figuring out what you're going to be bad at. And I think it's hard to be great at something. And I think that's why, like, you look like Michael Jordan, like Tiger Woods, Muhammad Ali, like, dude, those guys, like the price to be Michael Jordan, the price to be Tiger Woods, you're going to have, you know, they've had divorces. I mean, (laughs) Tiger Woods is like the greatest golfer of all time. You know, like he's got that psycho competitive trait. And I felt like when I played with you, you didn't have that like psycho competitive trait, but you were a competitive guy on the field. And I want to know like what you're doing now to get that competitive out, out, um, outlet, what you're doing these days. Yeah. Um, I think there's, there's a couple things. I will say this. I think, for so long, I've been really good at masking um, to to people, just like the way that my mind works. Um, and I think now, like I'm a lot more comfortable with trying to explain how it works. It doesn't always sound like English when I try to explain it. <laughs> um, and I think that's just part of the process. Um, and I, by no means do I have a Michael Jordan or a Tiger Woods mind. I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. Um, <laughs> but. I think the mind that I have is much more geared in like the opportunities of suffering. And like, I think I have, I've enjoyed suffering in sport and in trying to reach like the depths of personal growth for so long that I don't know how to go a day without suffering because I feel, I feel stagnant and I feel like I didn't do anything. I feel like I didn't achieve. Um, so going back to your question of like, how am I, like, what am I doing now to like fill that competitive spirit? Um, Yeah. Or to suffer that void that I feel now with like not having something to work, like to, to go to every day and to do, um, I'm feeling it more like I I train every morning and I'm still hopefully going to get an opportunity with, with the team. Um, but outside of that, a lot of my focus is more geared into like the next venture of my life, which is hopefully going to be in something real estate. Um, so it's, I have like 120 hour certification course and there's certain things that I know are really important to real estate, um, that give you like a really great tool belt to, to achieve. And those are the things that I'm focusing on and like challenging myself to, to compete in quote unquote every day, like with myself, because now it's much more like in my mind than it is like against another person. Cause there's not another person sitting on a computer financial modeling next to me. Right. It's like, how long can I stay focused and how long can I be attentive and how much information can I walk away with in a day? And like, that's what I'm challenging myself with right now. What do you do physically to suffer every day? So I think like, yeah, it's like suffer, suffer, suffer is an interesting, like it's that, that word's such like a hot word. Like to me, it doesn't seem like suffering, but I guess to other people it could. Um, so like I have, I have non-negotiables every day. Um, I have five of them. And some people would be like, that's like, that to me would be suffering. To me, it feels like I'm setting myself up to like have a successful day. Um, 
So I'm going to answer those with this question. And so for me, it's waking up with the first alarm. So most days it's at 5.30. Um, and I have to get up on the first alarm. I can't like snooze it, can't do anything like that. It's my first difficult decision that I have to make every day is whether I want to get up on my first alarm or not. And I would say I'm like at a 90 something percent success rate. Some okay. days I'm like, nah, not today. Um, <laughs> I get up at like 540 or something. But like, that's my first thing. Like I try to make it a non-negotiable, get up on the first alarm. Second is attempt to drink 12 ounces of water. Um, sometimes like in one sitting. So sometimes that I always get 12 ounces down, but I try to do it in one sitting, like right when I get up and then within five minutes of getting up, it's a two minute cold shower. Oh, wow. um, and the cold plunge in the same day. Yeah. But that the cold plunge happens like after my workouts and all that stuff. Okay. So that's just, that's more of like a rehabilitative type thing that I do. The cold shower is there's like a lot of like added benefits to like when you're bodies in that like sleep state still um and then you get into like the cold shower it like boosts immune immunity like your immune system it it, it boosts white blood count cells over over time it like boosts a lot of different stuff so i do it more for like the longevity of my life as well as just it's a hard decision to make in the morning um where was that so i was at the the get up um the on the first alarm I drink water, I take a shower, I make my bed. Um, I have to make my bed. Have you ever read the book, Make Your Bed? Yeah, I haven't yeah. fully uh, instilled the concept yet, um, but I'm getting to it. I've read the book. I've listened yeah. to the, the YouTube yeah. video. It's by Admiral McRaven. Fantastic yeah, book. Fantastic book. It's so good. But the concept behind that is really what, what he said. is like, if all hell breaks loose in your day, at least you come home to, to a made bed. And for me, like, that's really important. It's just like, you make the decision to ha to accomplish something right in the morning. And like, for me, it's as simple as making my bed. So I, I get my first accomplishment out of the way in making my bed and I make it try to look as nice as I, as I did the day before, you know, and I know that, okay, at the end of the day, I have that to come back to. Um, and then I go downstairs and I eat a bowl of fruit. And that, those are like my five non-negotiables every single morning. And I would say I'm at like, 90 ish percent success with that every morning but um there's certain days where where i don't hit it and those are the days that i try to i try to focus on and make sure i build momentum on it but yeah some people will be seen as su suffering <laughs> i guess well they there is some you know sort of science behind it's come more bro science but um you know like chosen suffering will prepare you for unchosen suffering in life. I mean, getting up on the first alarm at 530, I think for a lot of people is a big step, not just snoozing their alarm. How much of an impact have you seen that in terms of productivity, phys like physical capability, stuff like that? Um, I think, I, I think that could, that's like a, that's an interesting question. Um, right now, I think I shouldn't be getting up at 530. I probably should be getting up around eight. Um, because Huh. I do my, I do my serve. I, so I serve at Cooper's Hawk right now. Okay. And, um, that goes into a whole nother, like the decision to, to work at Cooper's Hawk was not a good decision for me, <laughs> like why I made it. It was a great decision, like to go and, and make some money and, and do all that stuff. But the reason I chose to go to Cooper's Hawk was because I wanted myself to suffer. Wait, wait, what? Yeah, why? And, and, In what way? This was because it's like, in my head, I was just in the NFL, right? And I was being served. And like, there was a bunch of people that were like reaching out to me with like brand opportunities and people were hitting up my DMs like crazy. Like it was like, you were sought after, right? So like, and then I went back home and then I was having like this identity crisis. And I was like, okay, if I'm not a football player, who am I? And I was like, what is, what's the most what's the one thing that gives is like the most you have to have the most humility to do it's go and deal with and serve with the smile on your face the most some of the most pretentious people around right and you go from being served to being tr like treated like shit and serving other people right and them assuming that you have nothing else going on in your life right um 
and treating you like such sometimes. And so I made the decision initially to go work at Cooper's Hawk um, as a server because I felt that it was going to be the humility check that I needed in my life at that moment, which was because I wanted to suffer. So like that goes back into that whole thing of like, I had a very toxic mindset and now it's turned into something that's really good. Uh, today's actually my last day, but, um, wow. yeah, but just because like, I'm ready for something else, but it turned into something that was really good. But initially I had done it because I was, I wanted to suffer and I wanted myself to feel that like, you're not in the NFL anymore. And you're nothing. And like, so yes, you are a server and you're going to serve other people and you're going to be okay with it. And you're going to like, that's why I initially did it. It was like a very toxic reason. Wow. Um, but I moved on from, from that thought process since. You seem, on. you seem very self-deprecating at times. Oh yeah. How do you, how do you combat that? I know you said page, but how do you personally combat yeah, that? Yeah. I think like a lot of it's journaling in the morning. Um, and like setting my intention. And when I used to not set my intention, my intention was always to, to achieve at like the highest rate possible. And like, you can't do that. Like, that's just not something that can happen. You know, like there's going to be a lot more failures in your day than accomplishments. And so I set tangible goals that I can achieve now and, um, things that aren't based off of performance and things that aren't based off of like what I used to base everything off in the past. It's more based off, like I said, like efficiency. How can I create more efficiency in my day? Or like those are those are easy things I can do, and um, those are just choices that I have to make. It's not like performance things, like how like you know go touch the top of that, like, go touch a ten foot rim. You know, like either you do or you don't. You know, and like if you don't, it just means that like you're not good enough. With this whole like efficiency thing, it's just like it's a choice. Like, do I want to do it? Sometimes, no. But if I don't do it, then that's just, I, I made that choice. You know, I could have, I could have gone either way. So like, those are the things that I'm trying to do now is take it out of performance and like physical ability and accomplishment and put it more towards like tangible things that will help me as a person every day. What you seem like, I know you are, but like purpose and almost like philosophically driven and certain, at, like in everything that you do, like the cold the wake up, even like the Cooper's Hawk job was like, there was something more than just like making money behind it. What, what caused all this and, or not what caused it, but how, how come, I don't want to say like, how come you're like this, but like what? <laughs> I've been trying to figure that out for 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, what's the, what's the, what's the catalyst for it all? Um, I don't know. I think, I think I like, I had a fantastic fantastic like family life but I think outside of my family um like if I'm being honest like no one none of my friends around me like growing up wanted me to achieve and really? they all consistently like had tried to get me to play sports that they weren't playing none of them wanted me to play lacrosse they always tried to push me into other positions in football like the people that I or my friends growing up were not really my friends, you know, and it created this, like, as a kid, like, I lost a lot of trust in, like, people that I should be able to have trust in, and so I think it made me start to take everything and, like, keep it really close to my chest, and because I did that, like, I didn't experience how other people achieved, or I didn't experience how other people set goals, so I created all those things based off of the things that I heard that like Michael Jordan did and, like, <laughs> that these athletes did. And I created like how to have success in my brain at a very, very young age. That was probably very toxic. And it led to me not having a very like good social life in high school um, because I didn't involve myself with anything. Um, and even in college, like I'm very personal. I can talk to people one of my biggest issues is having lasting relationships because to me, I would see them in it. Like that sounds very, very cold and inhumane, but like that's something that I've struggled with for a long time because I've always put success and achievement over friendships. Um, 
and so like it started at a really young age just like developing these success habits that weren't necessarily um good i guess Mm -hmm. um and then over over time just in repetition like it just becomes a habit but i think that's part of what makes you you because you are able to kind of weed out the negative parts relationships and focus tunnel tunnel focus on what you want to do i think that's why you were you know all mac you got the Bengals contract in some respects because you're able to eliminate negative portions of your life and then focus on, because a lot of people miss like myself included, like a lot of people miss the drive and they are focused on other things. They really want something, but they're, they're over here not doing the thing that'll get them to what they want to do. Like for me, I had a big, you know, realization when um, COVID came, like I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to play, but I wasn't acting like I wanted to play. I wasn't living that. So I think what makes Jack Swanson, Jack Swanson a lot of is this drive to be the, the best in your mind. Yes, it gets toxic at times, but I think part of it is, you know, that competitive nature in you, like I'm going to go out and earn it. And I got to cut certain parts of my life out to, to get, you know, what I want. And I think you achieved a lot through that mindset. Um, But there has to be, you know, obviously like the pendulum effect of like, I can't be like this all the time (laughs) because I'm going to ruin a lot of relationships. Yeah. And I think that's, that's what I was running into a lot was I was, in my mind, I was telling myself that good things were bad. Um, and I was cutting ties with people and I was pulling myself out of great things like friend gatherings and, and friends givings and all these different things. Because in my mind, I was like, is this going to help you achieve your goal? Right. And it's like, that doesn't always have to be your thought process. Like it doesn't always like every decision that you make doesn't have to be, am I helping myself achieve my goal? You know? Um, But that's where my mindset was. And even, it even like for the first couple of years of Paige and I's relationship, like that was a huge contention point for us was she was not okay being second to football. And I didn't understand why, which sounds wild to me now That like, how could I not understand why someone that I want to commit my life to doesn't, isn't okay with being second to this 18 year dream that I had. Like to me in my head, I was like, how, how aren't you okay with this? Right. And like, and I'm not sure if someone like whoever's going to listen to this is going to be like, dude, you're so dumb for thinking that way. And yes, I agree with them. I am dumb for thinking that way. I don't think you're in the minority as much as you think you are. Like I've, I feel that way too. Like football was the most important part of my life. And I like fucked up a lot of relationships with people, a lot of things in my life. But I think like coaches go through that with their wives. Like I think there's a pretty high divorce rate with coaches. Cause like people become obsessed with sports. Yeah. And I think, I don't think you're in the minority of like thinking that way. I know I thought that way. But it got to the point where there was moments where I was questioning myself and my relationship with Paige and saying, is she deterring me from my goal? Oh. So like it got to that point where there was moments where she was asking me to do things when I could be training. And did I need to train? It was going to be maybe the sixth time I had trained that week, right? Like I could take, I could take a day off. Um, and I hadn't hung out with her at all, but in my mind, it was like, is like, this person's trying to pull you away from achieving your dream. Like, that's what I would say in my head. And it was like, but it was really you. No, it was me. Like I was the issue the whole time, but I wasn't introspective enough to realize that I was the issue. And I thought Paige was the issue. And like, we battled through that for a 
like no joke, like probably two years. Wow. And then we had like a very, very eye-opening conversation. Well, she did with me just kind of where she put it all out there. And she's like, listen, I'm not okay being second. And if that's what you can promise me, if that's all you can promise me, then like, you know, like this thing isn't going to work out. And it wasn't until like that moment where I had realized that like she had loved me unconditionally up and like even to that point, you know, and I hadn't done that to her. I had loved football unconditionally and I had loved her conditionally based off of football. And that hurt me so much to realize that I was doing to some doing that to somebody that I was saying I wanted to devote my life to. And that was really, really tough. And like that was an eye opening moment for me where I had to say like football ends, you know, but a relationship with her doesn't like that's going to be my long term thing. And so then from there is probably like a year, year and a half cycle of just trying to break out of bad habits of like, not just protecting this dream and like having it be football here, page here. It was like allowing Paige to come up and share the space, you know, and like integrating her into my life with football. So that took a while. What was the first step you took to integrating everything together? Um, first thing was just like, and it, and it came from Jaywalk. I'm sure you'll have him on here at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but Jaywalk and Nat used to do these little, uh, these workouts at the field. And so like one of the first things that Paige, Paige and I did was we just went and like started doing basic workouts together um, where I would do my thing, but she would also be there supporting and, and doing her thing. And it was just like allowing her to come into the space, um, like a space I had never really let people come into unless you were already in there. And so it was just allowing her to take some steps into the space. And then it was talking to her about, you know, more in depth about the game because to me, like the game was sacred. Right. And like, I didn't want to talk about it with someone that maybe didn't appreciate it the way that I appreciated it. And so then it was just like, it was bringing her into that side of it. And then it was bringing her into the decision makings as far as like when the whole draft process was happening. And like, we started talking with teams and like, you know, as we had to pick an agent, she was in a lot of those meetings with the agents um, and like kind of being my litmus test of like, is this person trustable? Like, you know, is, is this person a good person to go with based off of X, Y, and Z? So it's just like integrating her slowly into the process where she now is a big decision maker and, and how a big part of why I make decisions in football. Did college compound your obsession with football? I don't know. I mean, I would have to believe, yeah. I think I think the closer you get to achieving something, the more obsessive it gets, for sure. Um, so I think, I don't know if it was college that did it. I think it was the situation of being closer to achieving my goal made me more obsessed with achieving it. So I think that Do you think cool. sometimes college coaches blur the lines of – players goals and coaches goals because there's the team goal and then there's the 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 coaches have their own goals so do you think that line ever gets blurred kind of they want something for you more than you want it yeah oh yeah um i mean i think i think take take aside the kids that have a crazy amount of talent but just don't want to put in the work because i think that there's a lot of those situations where the coaches want it really badly for the kid but the kid just doesn't want it bad enough i think if you take that out and you just more focus on the MAC, like the MAC conference. The MAC conference is a stepping stone for coaches, right? Mm -hmm. Like no coach. Well, I don't think, I don't know. I can't say no coach. A majority <laughs> of coaches use it as an opportunity to like excel their career or like get to the next, the, the Big Ten, the ACC, the SEC, wherever it is, um, to jump. And so I think that there is a lot of like, personal ambition that goes into the the decision making that coaches have like at those places. Right. Um, which I get, you know, I, I, I get that. Um, but I think sometimes when they don't have a full understanding that they're doing it, it can blur into all these other areas of the organization. Yeah, I agree. I think there's a lot of, it almost becomes like a, it's a business because there's money involved, but like, now it's become so crazy like the transfer portal and coaches and like 
it's almost sometimes like if you leave, people get like resentment towards you. They're like angry that you left. And I know players that have dealt with that. Um, what do you think college prepared you for with your other endeavors like passion projects and the real estate stuff you're doing now? Yeah, I think it more than high school, I was I was already pretty good at like getting up early and making difficult decisions and training through pain and doing all that different stuff. So I think like college didn't necessarily change that. It maybe gave me a larger scale to amplify how good I was at that stuff. Um, (laughs) I think what it prepared me for was understanding that there's a lot more that can go into being great at something. And in high school, I, I really focused on like the physical side of things. Um, and more just like the strategy as the game went on. So like when I played receiver in high school, it would not be, I, we never watched film. So it'd be like, as I'm getting reps against a DB, I would start to figure out what they're not comfortable with. And then I would just like start to exploit it as the game goes on, but it might've taken me till the third or fourth quarter in college. I think you, I started to realize that there's like a whole nother area of this game that you can apply to compound the physical gains that you're making um, and just like accelerate your, your success even more. And I think like understanding that has allowed me to understand that like in real estate, I could just go out and start searching for jobs and then start at like the most entry level level position with no understanding of the industry, no financial modeling skills, no understanding, understanding of the different asset classes of anything. Or I can start to learn about everything that they might be teaching me and give myself a head start. And it's just like those type of things that I'm starting to realize that like, I guess football kind of prepared me for was just like looking through the blurred lines and like understanding the opportunities that lie there. But. Mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of intangible lessons that come with football and just sports in general. And I think that, coming out like I would recommend to high school kids to play a sport in college in college because I think it prepares you a lot for what's ahead in the future and what's going to be, you know, what you need intangibly. Cause I think all the lessons come intangibly. Like, yeah, you can learn financial modeling. Yes. You can go to school and, you know, learn these marketing tactics to you know, excel this brand. But I think that the intangible aspects of sports and like I like will die saying this I learned more in the football field locker room weight room than I ever learned in any single college course I have two degrees I didn't learn as much as I did on the football field and I think you would resonate with that and I wanted to see what like what your thoughts on like that is you know like what are your What's your opinion on how much you've learned? Yeah. Uh, I mean, in, in those, in those senses, like exponentially, you know, like how to work as a team, how to lead, but also how to be led. Um, I think like those are two really important things. Like even as a leader on the team, you're still being led um, and there's still opportunities to learn. And I think being in an environment like the one that was at Miami, there was a lot of great leaders around us um and just being able to like work as a group to help a group of like 100 and however many it was 110 kids like or adults i guess you could say like (laughs) form the same common goal and then like work towards it every single day was like really challenging and it changed every single day and i think just having that ability to react uh and change course if necessary and then change course again but still like move forward is going to be like a skill, like, like you said, an, an, an intangible skill that I can carry with me forever. Um, so the, definitely the leadership things and the teamwork. Um, and then, I, yeah, I mean, I think just like the, the ability to grind, you know, like there's, there is nothing like college fall camp and <laughs> summers. And like, there, there really is nothing like that. Even the Bengals, like the Bengals was tough, but doesn't, I mean, it doesn't touch like what we were doing at Miami, you know? I think that's when the team like comes together though, is during fall camp. 
just like yeah. the misery, like misery loves company, like the misery of doing that is misery brutal. Loves. Yeah. No, I definitely, I, def- I definitely agree. Yeah. But I think, yeah, I mean, I think it's taught me some, some things that are going to be great when I can start to understand how to apply them. Um, but yeah, I think they're, it teaches you so much. And, and I'm sure like, even, even in your situation, like you came in as a walk on into college and worked your ass off and was at the bottom of the barrel and worked your way up to pretty much like the glue, if not like the main leader of this last season's team. And I think just like what you probably learned in that experience of what was it five years for you or is it six? That's five. Five. I wasn't six. I wasn't I wasn't <laughs> entrenched as you. Um yeah. And McWood did seven. It, yeah, I know. That's ridiculous. But I like I said, I just can't imagine like what you learned in that time from coming where you went in as to where you went out as is like ridiculous. Like that that's a true transformation of of a person, a player, a human, like it's ridiculous. Um, so actually, like, honestly, I would love to hear from you real quick. Just maybe like in those five years, like what was, what were some of the biggest things you learned about yourself um, that you didn't realize before? Oh, shit. Um, You're flipping the script think, on this podcast. What? Flipping the script on this podcast. I know. It feels weird. Um, I would say the biggest lessons you learn is you, you first learn how to help a team goal, you put the team's goal above your goals and you get to learn how to help others at the beginning. So like when I came in, I was a a walk on and you come in, you're like, all right, I need to serve, you know, the guys that are going to play. So I need to help them. So you learn how to, you know, push everything towards the team goal. So you get the broad perspective of, you know, where the organization is going. Then the lessons you learn is you you get to kind of take what other people do. So like your bottoms, so like you get to look up and see like I can pull this from you know Jack and I can pull this from someone else and I can implement it in my game. That's what you get when you're super young. So like I from you I pulled you know just being in really really good physical condition. Like you're the most in shape guy on the team. Like we wasn't even close when we did conditioning, you would smoke us. It wasn't even fair, but you get to learn like, all right, Jack never gets tired. So he's never physically tired. So he never makes mental mistakes because you know, when you're physically tired, you get lackluster and you make mental mistakes. And then you get to pull things from other people. It's like from Cam Butler, I pulled like, you have to have this mental switch of like, once the field, once you step on the field, you kind of got to, you know, flip this mindset of got to be a little bit crazy. So I kind of pulled that from him. Um, and then you get to see everything, you know, from, from the broad perspective. And then you get to focus on your game individually. And then I would say, you know, transitioning, you get to develop a niche. So like my niche was like special teams. Um, and you find you know, holes within the team that you can implement yourself in. So like mine was special teams. I knew I was never going to play receiver. I knew I was never going to do that. So I kind of accepted that. And I was like, I'm never going to be as good as Jack or Mac or, you know, Mick Wood on defense. So I knew special teams is the way to go. And then you kind of develop the skills around there. And then as you get older, I think, you lead by example um, and you kind of can, you know, pave the way of for other people, you know, telling them you have to work extremely hard. Like no matter what, I just, I just learned how to extreme work extremely, extremely hard for, you know, my goals. Um, So as like an older person in the program, you learn how to, how to help others develop that same kind of, you know, capacity for getting better and building for a team goal. So like, there's just a bunch of lessons you learn. I could probably do like four hours on that, but. Um, so I have, I have a follow-up question to that. When you, <laughs> when you earned your scholarship, did you ever feel a sense of complacency? Like Ooh, I shit. did what I set out to achieve, you know? 
Did like was hmm. there a moment where you ever? Felt I wouldn't like say like I got complacent. I think I had a hard time, and I think you kind of alluded to this earlier. Was like I had a hard time understanding like it's a weird feeling like because like my goal one of my major goals going into Miami is like I'm I want to earn a scholarship so like I want to be you know a scholarship guy I didn't feel complacent it almost felt like and I think I struggled this a lot like like I did like I felt like I earned it I don't know it's a weird feeling because you kind of stand there and you're like, first you question, did this really just happen? And then you know you earned it. But then you're standing there, you know, I drove home after and I was like, kind of like what's next, you know? I didn't like, I didn't think about it a lot. Yeah. Did you ever get the, that's it? Like No, I never did. No? No. Like that? I never did. Okay. Yeah, it's weird because I think people, you know, that happens to people like they earn this, they get this, they win an award. Like I hate awards in general. Like I think they're weird. Like I give all my stuff to like my dad. So like I've got like a couple like awards. I don't like them. I don't know why. I just never really felt like. But I think earning the scholarship was just part of, you know, the journey. Um, It was never like. Did you I did it. it. Now I can. What? Did you ever celebrate it? Not really. No. Yeah. See, that's, nah, that's I, interesting. Because I think that's something that I struggle with still. Like a lot. And I think maybe you struggle with a very similar thing. Is that you don't feel as though the things that you've been working towards your whole life, when you finally achieve them, that you earn the right to celebrate that. Mm-hmm. You know, um, cause that's yeah, I think it's imposter that's, syndrome. That's some people's, I mean, that, that was like what you just said, like that was one of your biggest goals. And when people set, when people achieve goals, like they celebrate them, you know, and it's interesting yeah. to me hearing you say like you achieved one of the biggest goals in your life and you didn't really celebrate it. You know? I think, I think, well, I think I changed my mind, you know, halfway through football college football was like I was focused so much on earning a scholarship and playing and I was like losing sight of kind of what you talked about earlier like just like the day-to-day yeah like like I'm living out a dream of playing college football like that was my dream when I was little and then you get there and then you know you're doing it so like I had to kind of take myself back because I wasn't playing very well and then, you know, I ended up playing more and I, I I had to take myself back to like when I was younger and be like, dude, you're just living out your dream. Like stop focusing so much on, you know, playing in this aspect of the game or, you know, uh, earning a scholarship. Like I had to take myself back to like when I was like little, kind of be like, you know, seven year old Chris is pretty proud of you right now. Just like keep working hard. And I think just through that mindset, I kind of just like fell into the scholarship a little bit. Okay. Like not fell into it, but like, that's not what I'm trying to say. Um, I'm saying like, like I kind of just like, it just kind of like happened. Like, Oh, like, Whoa. I, Cause I was just so, so focused on every day. Like you kind of lose sight of the big picture. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it's a cool feeling, you know, the coolest feeling is definitely like the teammates and like the video, um, everyone like mobbing, but it, it's a, it's cool, and then you're just kind of like, all right, like go back to work and keep working out. So like we had a workout right after, and I kind of just forgot about it. Um, it was cooler for my parents. My parents, that was the awesome thing was calling my dad. Well, I actually didn't tell my dad. I waited till the video came out, and I was like, he's gonna be like crying. So it was, that was fun. That's awesome. But I never really think about accomplishments like that. I try not to. Too. I think I purposely do that. Why? Why do I do that? Yeah. Because I think then it's just like I become obsessed with numbers and statistics and this accolade and that accolade. And I lose sight of like why you do it in the first place. You know, you play football for, you know, a team. And when you start focusing on the why instead of the the outcome. Um, 
you get better results, I think. Yeah. And I'm sure you feel that way with, you know, you probably thought like, I really want to make the Bengals and you kind of lost sight of, I'm still playing football at 24, you know? Yeah. No, definitely. I think Mick Wood's pretty good. At, like he's a, he was a big part for me of just like being where your feet are and just being like content and happy with, you know, you always want to achieve more, but being content and happy with your, your progress, you know, um, moving forward. Yeah, man. Yeah, McGood was a blessing these past, like, six six weeks for me. But I do want to say, Cab, I think <laughs> when I think of you, like, I think you are the perfect example of, like, the tortoise and the hare. Because <laughs> I'm slow? <laughs> well, no, not, not because you're slow. But I, think, I think, like you said, like, your gift is out grinding people, right? Like, you will work longer and harder than other people. And eventually when other people take their foot off the gas, like you surpass. And I do want to say, like, I think in that regards, you taught me a lot as a person. Um, I think I was pretty good at that. But I think even in college, I found moments of time to chill. And I think, like, you always found how to occupy in productive ways a lot of moments of your time to help you achieve your goals. Um, and I think like that's, that's pretty rare. And so I just, I wanted to say thank you. Cause I think you taught me a lot about that too. Even whether you realize it or not, I think just seeing every single day you walk, I walked in and I'd see you doing your pull-ups as you <laughs> at the line um, in pregame, getting off on punts. Like it was the, the, the smallest things, but you took pride in, in them. And it, it was, it was a really beautiful thing. And obviously now seeing the success you had, um, which I don't think a lot of people thought would come, uh, is, is pretty incredible. So I appreciate that, man. I mean, there's not a number of lessons that I, there's not a, like a quantifiable number. I mean, the amount of stuff I've learned from you specifically is crazy. I mean, I couldn't, I can't even count the amount of lessons like you've taught me, the amount of lives you've impacted at Miami. It just, I wouldn't say like, I think the best way to phrase it and the best, like the number one lesson I think I pulled from you is you don't have to be a leader in a vocal way. You lead by the best leaders are the ones that lead by example and lead by their preparation and how they're going to be day in, day out, consistent leadership and consistently doing what you're supposed to do. And I think that's what makes you, you is your ability to stack days and be the same person every single day. So I, I'm blessed to have that. You were a huge inspiration to me. You know, even when we were in, I was in high school and I played against you, you had no idea who I was. You were an inspiration back then. And I think you're, you're such a great leader just for anyone. Like, your ability to stay focused, stay consistent is amazing. I really appreciate, you know, everything that you've done for me and hard conversations we've had together at Miami and hard conversations. I mean, it's, it's been amazing. I appreciate you. For the hard conversations to come, man. And when the heck <laughs> do you come over and use the cold tub? Stop listening out. We got to plan a time. I need to get in there. I'm being, I'm being scared. I'm not going to lie. I'm a little scared. I don't, I'm not good with cold water. I'm not good with cold water. It's all but good. we're, yeah, we'll, we'll find a time. I'll text you. Could be tomorrow. I don't know. I'm here tomorrow. It's all good. All right. I appreciate you, brother. Yeah, man. This is awesome. I appreciate you having me on. It's cool that you finally talked about doing this years and years and years ago. <laughs> <laughs> No, seriously, I feel like people talk about doing stuff all the time, but you're actually making it happen, so I'm excited to see where the heck this thing goes. It's fun, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm jealous. Well, hey, don't 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 be afraid to have me on twice. It's all good. Oh, dude, you'll be on multiple times. <laughs> We're gonna have a lot of reoccurring guests. When you when you like, I don't know, run a ultra marathon. Dude, Iron Man's gonna be the first thing. I got one in June. I'll be there. Tell me where and when, and I'll be there. You want to come? You probably do. The thing is, what's you're going to happen is you're going to come, and you're going to get competitive, and you're going to lace up your shoes, put your swimsuit on, and you're going to beat me. Okay. Now, I my my <laughs> my sister's fiance, he did an Ironman, and seeing the prep and the 
anguish that goes on during one of those races, like I will never just go and do one. I will. I'm excited for it. Period. Then. Um, so yeah, dude, let me know when. We're, is it in Chicago? You do Chicago one? It's in Michigan. Michigan. It's in oh, Michigan. that's not far. I'm there. Yeah, come on, come when on. The day, when, where, how I can. June twenty fifth. June twenty fifth. Yeah. We have a goal for the passion project June fourth, not to come up June twenty fifth. P- passion project. Give a quick uh, plug for that. Passion project. It's a. Uh, it's an organization that is heart and sold by Paige, my girlfriend, and um, I am. Just and you. A background supporter for her vision. And especially like what the vision is, is we want to provide aid um, to any more grassroots level foundation, like nonprofit foundation that's trying to make sustainable change in their organization. Um, so to give an example of this, we partnered with Women Helping Women, um, who's a women advocacy group, um, and they support survivors of sexual assault. And we oh, wow. supported them uh, when, when I was going through my um, pro day at Miami, just to raise awareness and bring the conversation of sexual assault and abuse into a very hyper masculine space and just open the door for conversation. Um, so we did that. We're going to be partnering with, I don't know if I can talk about everything right now, just because it's not set in stone, but we're going to be partnering with a bunch of different organizations and providing an educational field day where we're exposing um, kids from a couple different foundations to different, ed- different um, post college employment opportunities um, within the real estate industry in Chicago. So, um, we're doing stuff like that. Uh, we do some grant work, we do some funding, we do some management work, marketing, whatever, whatever you really need. We we're, we're kind of like a jack of all trades, but heart and soul by Paige, And I just try to help her. So that's awesome. Well, let me know if I can do anything to help. Um, so you focus on your iron man. Okay. No, I'm saying let's, let's put it on. I'm making a hat. For my Iron Man, let's put it on. Let's put the logo on my hat, Dude, I love just it. for fun. No, I'm going to. Just for fun. Not just for fun, but just a little marketing, fun. little branding. Now we'll have it no, on. Man, love where you. can people go? Where can people go to support and passion projects? And then where can people go to find you? Me, I don't even know what my my stuff is called. Um, don't worry about me. Just focus on the passion project. It's, so you can go www.thepassionprojects.com, and it'll bring up our whole website. There's donation links. There's some information on what we're doing, what we're going to do, what we have done. Um, and if you want to connect with me through that and just learn more about it, we have uh, opportunities to connect through our connection page on the website. Hell yeah. All right, brother. I really appreciate it. Yeah, man. This is awesome. I appreciate you having me on. Hey, you'll be back on soon. All right. Sounds good, man. Peace, brother.